Hello and welcome back. We're going to have a look at the dock shunter today. This is model number R253. Nice stop there, we'll switch the points. There we go. And off past the turntable. We'll go past uh, points number 18 there and we'll switch those and we'll just back up and collect some wagons. Nice and smooth you through there. And then once we've got those, I think we'll have a, a swift look at the 1957 catalogue. A swift look at the, the page of wagons here, or pages of wagons, page six and seven from the catalogue. R16 on the left there. And there's the, the buggy bolster wagon with log load on the right hand page, R212. And the original buggy bolster wagon without any load at all there, R110 sitting above. Terrific page of, of models, isn't it? That uh, wagon with a crane is some colour, isn't it? On the bottom right there. We'll pop that down. Have a swift look at the wagons. R16 brake van, long running model. Between the 1953 and 67, in, in a, various colours, I think. So lovely moulding. We've got the, the clip on running boards. Swift look underneath. We've got Triang, made in England. Sleeved wheels on with open axle boxes. Lovely, lovely metal chassis. It's quite heavy. And I love the printing, it is quite crude, isn't it? White roof, lots of warping going on all around, but that, that's part of the charm of these uh, sort of older acetate models. Just look at the, the bend in that. Mark II couplings, of course. So we'll pop that down, have a swift look over the, the box. That's got a price ticket on the end there, it's quite nice to have. Rubber stamping seems to have gone on slightly off square, doesn't it? And the box is missing its flaps, I'm not going to open it up and have a look. I mean, we can hear the, the packing ring moving around inside the box. R16 brake van, somebody seems to have scribbled on it there. So we'll, we'll just pop that down. And here we've got the, the bogey bolster wagons with log load. Now I'm not sure whether these log loads are original. They look original. I don't know whether they, they uh, always were part of a real tree or something, or whether they were sort of machined up pieces of timber like this. But uh, I think they look quite impressive anyway. Fairly uh, short, run, short run on the, this model in the catalogue, sort of 57 to 61, although the, uh, the bogey bolster by itself came along in 53, went through to 66. I believe the model changed in... Uh, about 1961 to a much uh, more advanced looking model. Have a look at the, the insert picture there. It had uh, more, more posts down its, down its run. So fairly lovely thing, separately fitted under frame there. We can see Trying's name and the, the two different model numbers there, R110 for the, the plane wagon by itself and R212 for the, for the one with the load. So made in England, again, Sleeved wheels, open axle boxes. These uh, retaining springs, which I think the original model didn't have, they were added so that this 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 variation could be made, and these these spring retaining retaining clips could be added. And we'll just have a swift look around the other side. You see these posts just sit in these little black plates, which push onto the the deck of the model. You can see planking under there as well. If I lift up the other model. There we have a, a slight break in the footage. I was about to lift up this wagon and, and show you the two bogies. I didn't notice, but uh, when I listened back to the footage or looked at the footage, I didn't notice all the fireworks which are suddenly going off in the background. I, I was sort of ignoring it, I think, when I was uh, recording the original piece. So this is some days later, as we were round about Guy Fawkes night here in the UK. So people tend to let off fireworks once it becomes dark. So we'll have a look here. We've got two, two different sorts of bogies. So I think this is the later one. And this is an intermediate one because I, I do have a second one I, I'd forgotten about. So if I just put this down, and we'll, we'll, have a, we'll have a look at the, uh, the third one I've got, which is much earlier. And it's uh, possibly the wagons in, in acetate. So it's in a Trying Railways box. And it's a, an earlier box, it says uh, Richmond on it. Let's just get the, get the wagon out and have a look. It's a slightly darker grey than the other one. Now we can see different bogies again. If I get all three of them up together, 
try and hold them up in the order. I think they were, they were manufactured. So I think that is the, uh, the early one, the, the mid period and, and the later one, perhaps there, maybe they went on to closed axle boxes with pinpoints. I'm not quite sure. So we'll, we'll just pop the other two down and just have a look at this earlier one again. There we can see that planking detail on, on the deck of the model. And these plates here, which hold these pins, they, they just slot in, into place. So they're quite nice. I think they often, often get lost. It's very, very shiny, this one. So I'm, I'm fairly certain this one's in acetate. And just look at that printing, how crude that is. And a little bit of overprint on the edge of the wagon there. Great big, thick, chunky wheels on there. And we've got Triang's name and just the model number. Try and get focus on there. It really doesn't like that, does it? That's uh, R10. It will focus in a second. There we go. And uh, made in England. Very, very shiny. It hasn't got too much of a bend in it yet, but I don't know at what point these things begin to go. I believe these uh, bogies were, were from the uh, early short maroon coaches. So really nice things to have. We'll just pop this down, have a look at the box. So they're trying railways. Made in England by Rovex Plastics Limited, Richmond, Surrey. So that's a, that's a slightly older box than the other ones. Tape going all brown there on the end of the box. R110, bogey balls to bargain. So that was before they were, they were sold with a load. We'll just have a, a swift look at these two boxes. And here we go. One of them's all faded away. We've got the effects of tape. We'll just see some wording there. But the rubber stamp's nice and legible on this one. R212, bogey bolster wagon with log load. So the box is in fairly nice condition. I think we're missing an end flap on there. Oh, sorry, corner flap or an internal flap on the box. We've got some pricing there. Focus does seem to be going all over the place all of a sudden. On my on my camera, so bogey bolster wagon with log load, eight and six, really quite nice things to have. And away she goes with this great group of wagons. Now we're going to have a, a quick glimpse of the headlamp there. Of course, you'd have to run a rather rapidly to get that lamp to glow very brightly. And you just follow her around the layout. You also need to be the right angle of view to see it through that sort of rivet in the bodywork there. A very distinctive sound, isn't it? Those ribbed or knurled wheels on the steel track. Some say that's to give it extra grip, and others say it's to give it that sort of a diesel sound. Whichever way, it does make quite a racket, doesn't it? We were just looking at the uh, wagons in the 1957 catalogue, the first year that the uh, bogey bolster was log load showed up, it was also the year that the, the uh, Dock Shunter R253 showed up, but she didn't make it to the 57 catalog. So we'll, we'll pop that to one side for a moment. And we'll have a look at the 58 catalog. Now I noticed when I was leafing through this that the bogey bolster wagons here, we've got uh, one with log load, which we've got on the layout today, R212. And then we've got R110, the basic wagon, but here she appears in, in brown, already brown plastic. Now, from what I've read, this was available in this color quite early on, so I think it's probably quite scarce. It'd be quite nice to find one of those. So we'll just flip through to the page of locomotives. There we go. And then we've got the dock shunter on the, the right-hand side of uh, page seven there. And she's carrying the number 57. I don't think she's ever produced with that number. And she doesn't have um, dock authority along the side. I believe at some point she was made without any markings for, for a starter set, but I'm not sure when that was. R253 oh, 040 oh, Dock Shunter Electric with working headlamp. Now it's the working headlamp, I think, gives this model part of its appeal. So we'll, we'll pop that down and we'll have a, a swift look at the uh, what sort of price she was in 1958. There we go, we've got the locomotives. R253 040 Dock Shunter, 32 and 6. We might as well have a quick look at the wagons. So we've got the 
the original bogey bolster there without load. And I think she's six shillings and five. Quite expensive, the, uh, these uh, bogey wagons. And then R212 bogey bolster wagon with log load. I think that's uh, seven shillings and six. So quite a jump to get that piece of timber and the, the two little spring clips. So we'll just pop that down. We'll have a, a swift look at the model itself. So it's unboxed, sadly. And uh, we can see there's a little bit of wear to the, the markings on the cab side there, number five. I believe we can find a, a black dot shunter with uh, a number three as well. In 1962, the model went red and had a, a number three. And then by 1972, it turned black again, but uh, retained the number three and she did get smooth wheels in, in the early 70s. This one's got those lovely ribbed wheels, which gives it that very uh, noticeable sound, significant sound on the steel track. Now the, this early model with the, the Mark two couplings has this strange feature here, later models, that this was, uh, this was infilled. So I think that's quite a weak point there. Let's just have a look at that underneath. You can see the coupling mounted into the plastic there. So you can see how that's gonna get chipped or damaged when it uh, inevitably runs into things too quickly. So fairly nice condition. There is a, a little bit of marking. So the markings are just beginning to wear, wear off a little through age and handling, I suspect. There's that important headlamp there. Look at all those rivets on the front of that buffer beam. Terrific, aren't they? Many models in the trying range had the, the buffers or the, the, the stocks or shanks molded into the plastic bodywork throughout the 60s, but this one retained the separately fitted buffers. It was quite late on into the 70s before the, the molding was changed, just, just so it had uh, metal buffer heads or plastic buffer heads, I think it was, very late on. Again, the other side, a little bit of wear to the top of authority there. I'm just going to switch points number seven, the crossover from the inside to the outside line there. A nice glimpse of the headlamp too, and we'll switch those back. And off into the third radius curve, just getting ready now to negotiate the incline. Just remove the securing screw so we could drop out the, the chassis and pop that down for safekeeping. Screw would just go through there, just in front of the horn. We'll have a look on the inside there. We can see the two metal tabs which hold the horn in place. Now it's in fairly tidy condition. A little bit of splatter from the, from the oil, oil off the motor. And we've got Triang's name there, R253. Built in Britain. I think we've got focus on that. And we can see uh, the hole there in the, in the front of the, the bonnet there where the, the light shines through. Nice metal rivet in there to, to keep it all neat and tidy. The metal buffers just push straight in. And as I said earlier, this gap here was filled in on later models, perhaps to make it stronger. It does look terribly fragile to me. I do tend to find these models with, with broken steps, even, even on, the, on the later variants. So we'll pop this down and have a swift look at the chassis. There we go, if you look at the insert picture, you can, you can see that here the motor running, the effects of those uh, ribbed wheels they give out a terrific, very, very distinctive sound. Just look at those wheels. They're, they're not exactly square in the in the, uh, in the in the chassis there. They seem to be seated like that. Perhaps that's from years of running around the track. Maybe great big uh, metal gears on the on the bottom there. Collection plate, and you've got that collection strip there. Folds in behind, goes up into the bodywork to make contact with the wheels. Very neat and tidy. Lovely great big screws hold, holding the, the collection plate in place. So we'll just have a swift look around. Cabling seems to have been uh, tidied up or resoldered at, at some point in the past. And these little pins which bring the current up for the, uh, the light bulb there do tend to work their way out from time to time. The light bulb looks fairly dirty, doesn't it? But I don't think we'll, we'll pull it apart too much to clean it. So we'll just have a look around. We've got that cap sitting on top of the pole pieces there. Securing screw passes straight through the plastic body working into there. Very simple affair. Really is a, a terrific thing. And here she comes, climbing up the elevated section here, making fairly light work of it, and a nice glimpse of the headlamp again there. 
and I love this shot. She swings around the curve in the track and comes onto the suspension bridge. We get a great view of the whole group of models there. Absolutely terrific. Now again, we've got to back off the power a little here, otherwise she'll tear away. And then just listen to the sound as she comes towards camera in, in the next shot. Just listen to the whine of the wheels on the track there. Absolutely lovely. Angle of view, not quite right really to see too much of that headlamp though. But I think that's probably it for this week. Thanks again for watching, it's hugely appreciated. If you look back again next time, we'll have something else from the range to look at. We'll just bring it back onto the inside line there through points number eight. Goodbye now.